Good afternoon, everyone. Happy Valentine's Day uh, and welcome to this, the fourth in our series of webinars all about Public Health England's Prevention Concordat for Better Mental Health. My name is Richard Taunt. My name is Lily Makura. And I'm Anna Howells. Uh, and if you've joined one of these webinars before, uh, thank you very much. Uh, welcome back. If this is your first time, uh, thank you very much for making time this lunchtime to join our discussion. Uh, as I said, we've, uh, we've been running these for a number of weeks. This is the fourth in the series. And today's topic is all about defining success outcomes for better mental health. Uh, so I, I think a huge, huge richness of debate we hope to get into over the course of our hour. Uh, very pleased indeed that we've got James joining us from New Philanthropy Capital to talk about all of their work around setting out a theory of change and how you link that to the most effective measures relating to your work uh, and we very much hope that you'll be uh, joining us in uh, discussion as we go through um, we'll talk about how we do that in just one moment but in terms of the topic defining success outcomes why are we why are we particularly interested in this well this is part of as i said a series of events all about better mental health uh, and some of the themes coming through that have all been sort of related to why measuring impact in public mental health is so difficult, the breadth of organisations involved, the breadth of places where uh, results, where the impacts of better mental health might be, might be seen, uh, the long term nature of a range of interventions we are, which you may want to, may want to see. Uh, and so all of these you might think are reasons why actually trying to define what, you, what your success outcomes, what your measurement approach might look like might be too difficult and might be something to put in that too hard box and come back to another day. Uh, we think probably that's that's not the best approach and so we're going to try and get into some real uh, practical solutions, tips, tricks uh, about how you can best approach defining success outcomes today. So um, without further ado, uh, Anna, how can people get involved today? Yep, so there's three ways you can join the conversation, either by typing your questions into the question box that's on your screens, um, emailing us at hello at kaleidoscope.healthcare, or joining the conversation on Twitter using hashtag prevention concordat. Lovely, thank you very much indeed. Uh, hopefully you've got, uh, you're able to see the slides which have just popped up. Uh, we've also just put those in the little handouts box uh, on GoToWebinar. Uh, so if you want to download those to look at in forensic detail, or send to your loved ones as a belated Valentine's Day present. I could not imagine something more interesting. Uh, please do that as well. Um, so before we get on to our main discussion, uh, Lily, I think you're just going to give us a bit of context, a reminder about what we're talking about. Absolutely. So we're here today really to focus on the Prevention Concordat, which is really directed at helping everyone, particularly local areas, to focus more on what they can do to reduce the prevalence of mental health problems. And that's by, particularly by focusing on preventing problems occurring in the, first, in the first place, but also promoting good mental health. So that's about every one of us, as well as those particular groups that are often much more vulnerable because of particular risk factors. So through the Concord Act, we actually want to take help you to take the evidence of what works and there's a growing amount of evidence of, of what we have proven to show makes a real difference to people's lives and to communities transfer that over to action that happens at local area level but also making sure that we pull in as much effort and and, and resources and assets as possible both from local communities but also from national organizations so we've had signatories from um, different parts of um, the mental health sector, so charities, as well as some new organisations that are coming on board to start to look at what they can do, such as faith groups and, and others that can, again, help make a difference in terms of preventing mental health problems and promoting good mental health. Okay. And this event today, it, 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 Lily, is this the only event we're doing as part of the, <laughs> no, the Prevention so Concordat event series? We are in the very fortunate position of, of, of being able to get out and about and be able to sort of share the knowledge of what works about preventing mental health problems and promoting good mental health in different parts of the country, as well as through these webinars. So we've already been to Bristol, Durham, Sheffield and London and had some great conversations and exchanges there. So with people... I think we had up to 91 at one event where actually again there was a lot of energy in the room of people again sharing what what they know works and also you know how they can sort of plan better and improve their prevention planning arrangements 
we're heading off to Nottingham tomorrow and then, you know, again, continuing around the country to places like Cambridge, Plymouth, um, Birmingham, and again, back into London again, again, to make sure that, that there's an opportunity around the country for you to actually be involved and engaged. But obviously, many people that are to reflect and think and and this is where the webinars come in so again we've been hosting a series of webinars this is number four in our series um, and we're going we really want we'll to this time look at how we define and, and consider success outcomes lovely thank you very much uh, so just to say you might well have joined us in one of those uh face-to-face -face events so far uh if you haven't or if you want to sign up for any of our further digital discussions uh, preventionconcordat.co.uk is the website to go to which has uh, all of the registration details and it gives you the ability to watch back on past digital discussions um, and i think that leads us to pick up on your point about the range of discussions we've had around the country uh, absolutely, I, I, I think people at all of those events have stressed why having a clear idea about what you're trying to achieve, what success looks for you, is important. But, but I don't think yet we've heard anyone who thinks that they've completely cracked it. No, I mean, so we know that, you know, consistently we've heard people say that, you know, collaborating and coming up with some shared outcomes and, and objectives is really important and that's either because you identify one thing that's particularly important to everybody or that you actually bring together ideas of different people's you know sort of organizational objectives and, and nail it that way or through through communities but again I think that's going to be the really exciting and interesting bit of our conversation today about you know the different ways of pulling that together and measuring that Lovely. Great. Thank you very much, Louis. Uh, so um, we will we will move on. And just to say again, thank you very much indeed to James Noble from New Factory Capital, who's going to be joining us and talking about all of the work going on there around theory of change. Uh, you might be thinking, uh, what's this got to do with, with better mental health? Uh, and James is going to explain exactly why. Uh, James, thanks so, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Um, shall I begin? begin away okay 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 well thanks very much for the opportunity uh, i work for new philanthropy capital mpc we're a charity uh, and we work with other charities uh, and our mission is to help charities to be as effective as possible and we focus a lot on evaluation on impact measurement and so on so the topic that i've been asked to speak about is defining success outcomes and the approach that we use for this is something called theory of change. And so in my eight minutes, I'm gonna give you a quick overview on what this is, uh, why it's useful, and then how to go about it. So just first of all, to be clear on terminology, at NPC, we use the term theory of change as a catch-all uh, for the whole family of approaches that do similar things. So you might have heard of logic models, outcomes mapping, log frames, and so on. Uh, and if you're familiar with the nuances of these different approaches, you could rightly quibble with this, but uh, we, we kind of find it helps to see things that way. Um, so what is a theory of change and what are its key features? So uh, a short definition is that it's a process for thinking about and describing social programs, projects or organisations. Now, for me, its key features are, uh, first of all, it comes with a set of terms or concepts that help us think through the different components of programs. And that you should tackle these uh, components in sequence, which I'm gonna run through on the next slide. Secondly, uh, the process of doing it should be collaborative. Everyone involved in a program should be contributing, uh, which is partly about ensuring the output is good quality, but it's also to get the benefits of the process itself, which I'll also come on to. Thirdly, the output of a theory of change process is often represented or summarized as a diagram, but it doesn't have to be. And fourthly, the last stage of the process involves scrutinizing or challenging the theory of change to see what the weaknesses or assumptions are. It also involves engaging the existing evidence base to make sure that the theory of change is uh, accords with that. So on my next slide, um, yeah. So here's an illustrative theory of change that shows the different components. And I'm gonna run through this. You'll see that it's for a peer support service targeted at people with lung problems. Uh, and I've, I've deliberately chosen a, a physical health intervention just to 
to show really that the uh, the components are generic and what I hope you'll be able to do is just see how these components or concepts are relevant to your own mental health uh, related interventions. So in terms of the sequence we start the process of building a theory of change by discussing context at the top which means thinking about the issue we want to tackle, the causes of the issue and the consequences of that issue, who else is working on it in our communities and importantly who we want to work with in our project to tackle that issue. In other words our target group and that's where you begin. We then move on to talking about impact so we work backwards and impact is defined as the sustained long-term effect we want to see in the world. And it's important to appreciate that our beneficiaries, our service users, will achieve impact themselves. They will manage their health condition and they will maximize their quality of life. Okay. So next we think about short-term or intermediate outcomes, which are in the yellow boxes here. Now we see these as assets or capabilities that we want to give our service users, which we think will help them to achieve the impact to the right. We then think about our activities, uh, which is on the left hand side in the red box. And this is kind of the easiest part. Uh, essentially, it, it's a description of what we're doing and how much and with what quality. And then finally, the interesting part, which is in the orange box, it is how we think our activities will achieve the change we want. Uh, and another way of thinking about this is what is going to happen on the day whilst we're delivering. And for me, this is the heart of the theory of change. Uh, and we've recently started to refer to these as mechanisms. Okay, so that's the theory of change, but what's the point? Um, and I think we can group the benefits under three headings. Firstly, around mon monitoring and evaluation. Uh, and it's the obvious point uh, that until you know what something is trying to achieve and how, you can't measure how effective it is. Evaluation is about testing the extent to which this model happens in the real world. So I think it's illogical uh, to start thinking about the data you need until you have something like a theory of change in place. But as well as helping you with your evaluation plans, a theory of change can also help you to write up your findings when you've got the data. Essentially presenting evidence against each of these components is the best way to construct a persuasive narrative about whether the program has made a difference. The next benefit of three is that the theory of change can be used to quickly communicate about a program, for example, to potential funders. So um, more than this, uh, the discipline of having to be concise can help people to organize their thinking. Um, so I work a lot with social entrepreneurs uh, and they're often quite brimming with ideas, lots of different ideas and lots of things they want to do. Uh, and helping them to focus and get their ideas onto one page really helps them to be clearer, uh, both to themselves and to others. And this leads to the third main benefit, which I loosely call strategy. Uh, and basically done in the right way and with the right people in the room, a theory of change process is a good forum uh, for asking important questions and getting teams to a common understanding. Often uh, just getting everyone to agree an impact statement can be a really valuable thing. Uh, and once you've done this, uh, charities that we work with often realize they're doing things that won't help and them achieve impact or they're not doing other things that might. Um, so for example, I was recently working with a charity whose mission is to help people cook healthier food at home. And the main thing they were doing is cooking meals in communities and having people along. Um, and through the theory of change process, they came to realize that this isn't really good enough by itself, that what they need to do is to encourage their volunteers to talk about the food, to share information, to enthuse about the food. Um, now, this might seem quite obvious, uh, but it's through the theory of change process that we get people to have these conversations and to agree on a collective decision to do something different. Um, the team building benefits are also important. Uh, we recently did a theory of change for sail training, uh, which is taking young people on voyages on tall ships, and it helps them uh, make new friends, uh, work in teams, work independently and so on. Um, and there are about 10 of these ships across the UK, and they all work quite independently. 
uh, and we help them to agree a, a collective theory of change which describes what they're all aiming to do uh, and as a result they have a stronger sense of their shared mission uh, they can communicate in a shared voice and, and they're also a better place to understand the ways in which they're similar and different to one another uh, which should start to help them learn from each other um, so our next slide um, shows how developing a theory of change uh, leads you nicely on to thinking about the different types of data that you might need and we've come to realize quite recently that there are basically five different types of data that any social project uh, could collect from their beneficiaries so the first at the top is user data uh, and this relates to context and it's the information you need to collect from people at the outset to check that you're reaching your target group or those with the most needs then number two is engagement data and this is the system that you need for tracking who comes back and who doesn't and who engages the most and how people engage the third type of data is feedback uh, and these are the efforts that you go to to find out what people think of your service or your project and we divide this into formal methods like questionnaires and focus groups and so on and informal which are the kind of more subtle ways you encourage people to tell you what they're thinking as and when they're using the service so together these first three types of data are, we think are the routine information that all projects should be collecting uh, as a matter of course and the final two types are harder uh, and so need to be approached in a slightly more circumspect way uh, depending on the needs of the project so outcomes are the early stages that the project is working to achieve the change you want and the final type is data which is uh, sorry which is impact which is the most difficult to collect because it involves keeping in touch with people uh, to see how their lives have changed and that's challenging the one thing i'd say about outcomes and impact is that you rarely need to collect this data from everyone what you're essentially trying to show is that the project can work is capable of working which means you can focus your att attentions or your efforts on smaller samples of people so uh, this is a very quick summary uh, but uh, hopefully it's shown you how a theory of change process uh, is a sort of systematic way to help you think about the data you need but it also gives you uh, a way to communicate quite neatly about a project and also uh, bring people together it's a forum for helping people to discuss these things um, I'll just end by highlighting a weakness of the theory of change proce process and the, and the output which is that it can make things seem a bit too simple a bit too divorced from the real world a bit too linear that's a criticism we get and, and we agree with this um, but I don't think it makes theories of change uh, not useful at all uh, and there's a famous quote from a, the statistician George Box about scientific theories which is that all models are wrong but some are useful uh, and I think this is a nice way to think about uh, what theory of change is trying to achieve thank you James, uh, lovely. Thank you very much. Um, uh, and I, for one, will certainly be stealing that quote to use elsewhere. I'm sure other people on the line are thinking exactly the same. Um, so what we'd, what we'd love, James, I'm going to come to you with just a couple of questions in a second, but just to remind us people about how to join the discussion today. Anna, how can people get involved? Yeah, so there's three ways you can join, either using the question box facility on your screens, um, via Twitter using hashtag prevention concordat, or via email, um, and you can email us at hello at kaleidoscope.healthcare. Lovely, thank you very much. Uh, and what we particularly value are sort of any uh, questions, responses, reactions to to James, uh, but also sort of how how this fits with sort of uh, what you've been doing in your area. Does this resonate with you? Does it seem about right? Does it seem helpful? Uh, is this, uh, it's, it's a model, it will be wrong. Is it a helpful model? Uh, we'd love to get your sort of views, views and reactions as we go through, um, and I think we're going to have a really good discussion. Uh, James, if I can steal, if I can claim a chair's prerogative and just start with a couple of questions, then I'll, I'll pass to Lily, and we hope people will get involved uh, through those different means. Uh, so, James, you say you you, you work with uh, a lot of a lot of charities using this model. Uh, I'm, I'm sure we've got a lot of people joining, some from charities, but also from public sector organisations, local authorities, uh, healthcare, sort of justice and beyond. How applicable is this model beyond just the, the, um, uh, the charity and voluntary sector? Um, I'd say it's highly applicable. Um, basically, it's, it's an approach for, uh, as I said, 
um, modeling social programs. So anything that is trying to achieve something good in the world or something positive in the world, um, is uh, you can apply it uh, to anything that, that fits the, that, that bill, really. So I first started using it, I was a civil servant, uh, and I used it uh, in a health and safety context. I was working at the health and safety executive, um, and I've used it in an education context in schools. Um, we uh, did some training for the Youth Justice Board a couple of years ago on theory of change. So it's highly applicable, uh, I think, across the board. Uh, charities find it particularly useful, I think, because um, they're, they're often motivated to do good things, and they're often motivated, um, and, and in some senses, it, it feels right to do good uh, in, in a kind of general sense. Uh, and our, our kind of uh, position or, or argument to charities that you can do even more good if you think a little bit more rationally about the problem you're trying to address and a bit more carefully about how you're going to go about it. Um, so that's that, that's the kind of main incentive for charities to get involved. It enables them to um, to be a bit more precise about their model and hopefully more effective. Lovely. Thanks. Uh, last one for me, James. And I'll, I'll pass to Lily. Um, uh, James, uh, playing playing devil's advocate, um, is this not just management jargon? Is, is this actually not when you when you strip it back how, how much of this is actually just good common sense planning versus a, a, a sophisticated tool we should all be we should all be subscribing to what what's the balance there i would say it's common sense um and I, it, it worries us that we don't like the terminology theory of change to be honest we wish we'd thought of a different well we didn't invent the term <laughs> Uh, but we wish we thought of some, whoever did invent it had come up with something different because it does sound a bit jargony. Uh, and obviously there's inputs and there's outputs and activities, all this kind of stuff, which can count, confound people a little bit. And um, there's a bit of a backlash, to be honest, against it. Um, but ultimately, like you say, it is common sense. It's, um, it, it's just thinking about what we're trying to do. Uh, and it gives you, the, the terminology gives you, um, um, just it's a useful way to think about things um, and um, uh, you can call it we've, we've called it story of change in places just to make it sound a bit nicer um, we're not really bothered about uh, what you call it or how you use it even um, what we're bothered about is the principle that you start uh, something and if you want to test something that you, you do have a, a good understanding of what it is in the first place James, uh, thank you very much indeed. So again, uh, uh, questions, comments, reflections on the text, but also uh, if you have a better name for theory of change, well, this, this could be the turning point. This, this is where we take it out of management jargon uh, and turn it into something else. Uh, so if you've got a cracking name for it, uh, let, let, uh, Lily. Um, yeah, and I, I just sort of add, add in and, and encourage people as well to think about, um, James has talked a lot about this being about services but also really this is applicable to a range of different types of settings as well you know those principles so you might actually be thinking um one of the my interests of things that i've been hearing about from when we've been on our journeys around the country is about you know actually things about you know how might you impact on on knife crime or you know sort of improving safeguarding arrangements and things like that and so again it's that's not necessarily about an individual service user however the process actually still works exactly the same in terms of you know, kind of looking at what you know your sort of target audience or customers clients whatever um, or communities are, are, are particularly interested in and your joint interested in and where you're trying to get to and these are very useful steps I think. Lily, thank you very much. James, so well, range of that. Well yeah. I just want to add to that I mean yeah we are talking I've talked mainly about projects that are trying to influence or help service users or beneficiaries. Um, I've seen it used in a mentoring context with individuals so you talk to an individual about what long-term change they want to see and what short-term change will help them get there and so on. Um, so that's another application, but you can also use it um, in an organizational setting or, or to influence or, or uh, work you're doing with professionals. So we often, in an education context, a lot of organizations are trying to influence teachers, uh, trying to get them to change their practice, uh, and it, it's applicable there as well. So we just need to think about the long-term change that you want teachers to, to achieve or to make and the process is precisely the same. 
And I've seen it used, for example, in, in a context of uh, an IT rollout within an organization, you know, getting people to change their behaviors around IT. Um, it's a very general tool and therefore is quite applicable in lots of different places. James, thanks very much. So, uh, James, just really interested, again, going back to your the, the benefits of why you do a theory of change. Uh, and you sort of uh, talked about that strategic uh, reason, about sort of this being a forum for getting people together and sort of creating that shared un shared understanding, which I think particularly resonates in the uh, in the better mental health context, where generally a lot of our conversations around the country have been about the need for a really diverse group of organisations to come together and to think about how all of their different actions impact upon the, the mental health of, a, of an area. And, and so James, I was just wondering, do you, do you have a particularly good uh, example of just of, of the process you'd go through in, in using this to, to work across organisations? You talked about that sort of the, the sale training example, mm. but, but if there's anyone listening thinking, great, this is really helpful, uh, I, want, I want to start a sort of a theory of change process uh, in my in my area, yeah, well, where where do you begin, and what does a sort of a successful process look like to sort of come up with a, a good theory of change? Um, I'd say an important thing to do near the beginning of the process is to be quite clear about what you're doing the theory of change on. Um, where it can go wrong is if there's not a clear understanding amongst everyone involved what you're talking about today. Um, and so I think um, the sale training, it was quite straightforward because they're all doing a similar sort of thing. And they, they start from a point of, uh, of, of acknowledging that, that and that their aims are all quite similar. And so it's, it, it was an easier job to bring everyone together there. And we did it in a workshop uh, and it took, took a couple of hours, uh, but just to get everyone to, um, uh, to, I kind of agree really what the, the, the terminology of what they're doing. Um, I, I, I think, I mean, the workshop approach is the standard thing, face-to-face, uh, -face, bringing many people together. It can be quite hard to facilitate that. As I say, if you don't start with a clear understanding of what you're trying to do or trying to articulate, that makes it harder. Um, but we have done it in different ways. So we did a theory of change, collective theory of change for sport in prisons. Uh, a year or two ago um, so um, and the way we did that was all online so I, we did a kind of questionnaire asking people essentially the questions you can see on the chart in front of you uh, but about sport in prisons and we had responses from about 50 different organizations all doing that work and it was their perspective on what the impact should look like and what outcomes are and, and so on and we took all that information together and synthesized it and presented back a theory of change for sport in prisons, um, which has gone down very well. So there are different ways to, to do it. You don't have to do a workshop. Um, I think I'd say, I'd say if you're doing it for the first time, try and be a bit more um, modest or, in your, or, or, or don't take on something too big. Um, so <laughs> you might be tempted to sit, you know, to take a whole place and talk about mental health within a place. That yes. would be quite difficult to do. Um, but you might have alternatively and preferably, you might have a smaller project you're delivering or planning to deliver and I'd say if, if you're starting on this I would I would start there um, because the, it gets harder the broader and the wider ranging uh, issues that are, that are at stake. James thank you very much we're, we're just gonna, James we're just gonna do a very quick test we've hopefully uh, somewhere in the in the internet ether uh, Jess Mukherjee from uh, Kent County Council is joining us Jess if you're listening in if you're to try and uh, say something or make any sort of loud noise just to see if your audio is working. Okay, we have done that that <laughs> test. Uh, uh, Jess, again, if you're if you're listening and trying to get in, uh, shout and we'll 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 bring you in. Uh, otherwise, we'll continue to try to work on the technical demons in the in the background. Uh, James, really really interesting, uh, really interesting thoughts. Um, again, just um, to run through how. Hello, people... can you can you hear me? Look at that, out of the blue. Uh, Jess, thank you so much. Hi. Sorry. Hi, can you, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you fine. Can you hear me? We, we, we can. I think after this, okay. after this okay. webinar, we'll go away and do a theory of change about, uh, <laughs> about involving speech. <laughs> sorry. Uh, 
<laughs> Jess, uh, thank you for, for battling against various technical elements to join. We're really glad to have you with us. Uh, and Jess, hopefully you've been able to listen to some of uh, what James has been talking about coming from the theory of change perspective. Uh, what we'd love to hear from you is about how you've approached this whole issue about how you define success outcomes, define what you're really trying to do and how you measure it in Kent. But do you, want, do you want to introduce yourself and talk about some of your some of your work locally? Yes, hello. Uh, I'm Jess Mukherjee and I'm a consultant in public health um, and I lead on uh, public mental health in Kent and I also lead for substance misuse um, and uh, yeah, that's me. Shall, shall I um, just launch into the please. public mental health programme in Kent? Yes, please. That'd be lovely. Thank you. So um, we've been in Kent, we've been working uh, systematically um, on public mental health for some years. And I think one of the ways that I've um, I've approached this is uh, in any in, in the same way that we would in, approach any um, program area. And I think that's what I noticed um, about public mental health. That uh, and this I noticed this some years ago that people were doing little bits and often doing um, some very good work. Um, so. I looked at so what a good program in say coronary heart disease would be. So what we did was we we started by taking it through systematic public health principles. So looking at um, a needs assessment, starting with needs assessment, looking at what the healthcare needs were for public uh, mental health, then looking at what if there were any health protection needs for public mental health and then looking at the health improvement needs for public mental health and then doing that through um, a, there's wider partnerships and links and commissioning relationships that we could so the first step was to have a, a as, as comprehensive a needs assessment as we could and work with the commissioners to do that uh, and then we and then identify the 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 key areas and obviously suicide prevention and in terms of um, Kent we've got quite high suicide rates um, so we found through the data the key areas that we that we really needed to look at um, and then uh, is, is this the sort of thing that you wanted me to is, talk about to checking checking Sorry. yeah so um, essentially then we looked at what uh, the importance of population health coverage around mental health promotion could be and we picked uh, themes such as reducing stigma, building resilient communities, workplace well-being, reducing social isolation and support for carers and parents uh, and we did this really it, it, and we, we themed this through our health inequalities program and we had a couple of um, obviously things that were quick wins, things that were important to do and uh, made sure that we had community development at the heart of it as well as some campaigns and publicity um, and building as much kind of asset uh, ba based data that we could as well. So that sort of covered us in terms of working with districts. I mean, Kent's a large county with 12 districts, seven CCGs, so it's quite a complex area um, to, you know, to do community development. So we just needed what what we thought we were best placed to do was um, to build community asset data and to work with the voluntary sector in in providing that. And it was really interesting to listen to um, the theory of change conversation because our theory of change in terms of public mental health. Um, was ostensibly to link it to health inequalities and the psychosocial stress mo model and cortisol model. So what we were looking at is saying that you know if um, stresses and strains of life and and, uh, and upsets as well as uh, mental illness are exacerbated by um, health inequalities, then what would the antidote to that be? And the antidote to that would be um, sharing. Um, having a caring 
um, community, having uh, a lot of things for people to do, having uh, getting people involved in things, and essentially this sort of five ways to well-being approach, which we added an extra one, which was um, a sort of uh, environmental one. So we called ours six ways to well-being, and. Uh, then you know the the prevention program really we we looked at men as our target group uh, because of the suicide rates um, and then we we developed a, sh a program of community um, a development which we called men's sheds Kent med sheds and we networked them across and uh, obtained funding for that worked with our community libraries in terms of well-being hubs. But I think the critical thing was we linked all of this to our suicide prevention strategy as, um, you know, this is pre-concordat, uh, you know, so now that you've spelt it out nicely within the prevention concordat, in effect, that we, we had done that through the prevent, uh, suicide prevention strategy. Um, and within that were things like mental health, first aid training. And I think a lot of areas have done very similar things. But uh, I think the key thing that we were trying to do is build it as a systematic program from the start. Um, and then, uh, of course, in terms of early help, um, in terms of illness prevention, we worked closely with the commissioners um, in the NHS uh, with primary care. Um, with crisis care uh, and again uh, with social care as well and we created a um, wraparound service um, with, with you know no no wrong door uh, very easy points of access and working very closely with the voluntary sector um, uh, as our delivery agents for this and this was called this is called live well so here we have employment, occupation, support for carers, signposting, um, as well as social prescribing uh, built in across a, a variety of um, voluntary sector agent, agencies across the county. Um, and this is again very much linked to primary care social work, very much linked to primary care um, development with our, uh, with our STP actually. So that's uh, so that that provided in a way the sort of secondary prevention uh, as well as easier access to things like IAPT and things like that. And then of course the other mod the other strand was a good uh, mental health treatment and recovery. So recovery treatment rehabilitation, uh, and again making sure that uh, people get the right care at the right time at the right point. And this is definitely in the in the realms of where we link up with the crisis care um, concordat, and also with um, the uh, the range of things that the council can provide. So it's not just things that are um, badged as uh, things for people with mental health problems, but these are these are things that the, the council provides routinely. And what we wanted to do is make sure. All services were easily accessible to people with mental health problems, but making that um, um, making that clear, I suppose, in our in our plans. Uh, and then, of course, a huge amount of work around children and young people, which is a sort of separate strand in itself, um, and linking that with um, with uh, uh, what we call in Kent the emotional well-being strategy. Uh, which links to Head Start, Early Help, Young Healthy Minds, all of those kinds of uh, creating an adolescent um, uh, health uh, service using um, existing resources that we had uh, and shaping up um, uh, access to CAMS services. I mean, does that give you a flavour? I mean, I, uh, of of some of the work w that we've done. Um, I think the key the key words there are uh, that we we would do this uh, in the same way that we would run any public health program and not give mental health and mental illness a sort of um, a mystique of, of uh, that we can't do it. Jess, thank you very much indeed. That's a, that's a great overview of your work there in Kent. And, and, and I think key points just linking linking back to the early discussion about how you've taken that that systematic programme. You haven't seen this as, a, as, as little bits on our own, how you've actually made it systematic, which I think chimes very much with with what, what James was saying. Uh, and, and, and James, how about, look, you, you wanted a new name for theory of change. How about something about taking away mystique? 
it's a, there seems to be a core element there about just setting it out in very common sense, friendly, systematic principles about how you get stuff done. So there we go, James, we go, we'll leave you to dwell on, on what we can do with Mystique as a new name. Uh, but I think questions are starting to come through. Ah, yes. Oh. Um, so we've got a great question from Sue. Thank you, Sue. Um, and I think particularly the last bit of this question will really resonate with you, Jess, because I remember you mentioned something very similar at the Bristol um, not in Bristol, at the Southeast Learning event recently. Um, but Sue's question is, within mental health, there can often be um, quite a difference between the outcomes professionals seek and those that service users consider important. So how do you decide the outcomes? Um, and surely the value of measurement comes from the validity of the question as much as the methodology behind it. Jess, do you want to start with that? It'd be good to get changed to you. Yes, uh, that's, music, that's, that's music to my ears. The the often we ask the wrong questions um so we've we so um i asked answer that in two ways firstly um commit the community development approach i mean a lot of people are a bit frightened to use the term community development these days but actually you've got to acknowledge the power difference and uh communities uh so what we what we're saying is our strapline is a life not a service we want people to have the life that they should have, that they want to have, regardless of the services. Um, and what what that means is, uh, I, an example of that would be our SHEDS uh, program. So we know that men, um, when they collect together and do the things that they want to do uh, and provide each other mutual support, it might not be um, what we want them to do. So they might want to go fishing, um, they might want to go to the football, they might want to do whatever they want to do. Um, whereas what we might want them to do is uh, move more, um, you know, get, get healthy, uh, reduce weight, stop smoking. But the outcome, uh, we're using WebWEMS. So we are actually, every single thing in our mental health program is sort of WebWEMS. So we can actually see if there's an improvement in well-being. Um, but also they will generate their own outcomes and we ask them to do that. So one of our outcomes is have you set your own outcomes and have you achieved them? So, uh, you know, there's a sort of mutuality in that in terms of um, acknowledging that those uh, sheds will just go on and they will um, sustain themselves even after we we don't have any more funding for them. And they are, um, that you know, that, that they can go and do whatever they want to do. Um, does that help? Uh, uh, and I think that, that yeah. That's right, Jess, I think that, that's spot on. Do you just want to uh, describe WebWEM for those who are not familiar with the term? Oh, it's the Warwick Edinburgh, um, what does it stand for? The Warwick Edinburgh Mental Health Scale, I think. Great. Does that work? I think it's something like that anyway. <laughs> I think that's enough for people yeah. to Google afterwards to, uh, to, to have a look at further. Uh, James, just on, on the same point, uh, really interesting about when you're thinking about what you are trying to achieve, who, in what perspective you're, you're channeling that through. Is it the professional's view? Is it the user's view? Is theory of change a good way to try and dissect that? Yeah, it's um, good practice in developing a theory of change uh, involves consultation with service users. Um, so how you do that, I mean, there's lots of different ways. You can involve them in the workshop process. You can share the uh, outputs with them, get them to comment. But definitely always um, getting that perspective um, strengthens the process and strengthens the deliverable as well. Um, the, the other thing I'd say on the question is um, that the, I mean, outcome, there is a tension here because outcomes measurement, as you say, if you want it to, to be valid, you've got to use formal methodologies. And you've got to use validated formal questionnaires like WebWEMS and others to do that. Uh, and that sometimes sits at odds with service users' own experience um, and what they want to tell you about, uh, which is why we are quite keen to, to, to encourage people to think about those first three types of data, uh, the user engagement and particularly feedback data, because that's where you collect um, users' own perspectives on your service and you're less constrained about in the, in the use of formal methodologies, you can actually focus on those mechanisms, those things that happen on the day, which tell you that something good is happening. Uh, and that's often much more um, recognizable to service users and much more um, 
um, interesting and engaging to them. Just thinking about young people, going back to sale training again, rather than asking whether they feel more confident, you ask whether they enjoyed themselves, um, which is a kind of a better question to engage them in. Great. Can I come uh, in? Uh, yes, please, Jess, do. Um, I think the difficulty with some of the issues around theories of change is that um, within public health and public health programmes, um, we're often um, talking at different levels of analysis. So there'll be a population level of analysis where we do need something structured, but then there's a delivery level where we actually want as much qualitative uh, information as possible in terms of the person's outcome. And there's got to be a sort of, um, there's got to be both actually, because uh, the theory of change has also got, particularly in a local authority, the theory of change has got to be plausible to the people who are giving us the money to fund the program. So that's why our theory of change in it, it, sort of for our program has got to be quite clear. If mental illness and mental health uh, is due to uh, cortisol in the body, if it's going to make you sick and it gets into your body through a stressor, then the antidote is to uh, calm that system down. And so everything that we can um, do in terms of intervention will be about uh, creating a cohesive society. So, you know, you, one will then come from the other. And then you, whereas if you're constantly reinventing your theory of change, it's quite difficult to sell that or difficult to um, make that very plausible and clear as a systematic program. I mean, it's not impossible, obviously, but, you know, you just might want to think about that in terms of, you know, population level um, versus um, on the ground, working on the ground. Jess, thanks so much. And Jane, it'd be good to get just uh, uh, your reaction back on that. It would be lovely if we could have a full-blown debate. That would be great. <laughs> Let's have some real disagreement. But I think we've had another, uh, more questions coming through. Anna. We have, yes. And um, thank you, Adrian, for this question. Um, so Adrian asks, um, for very long-term changes, is it valid to measure short-term believed indicators of long-term change? Um, and in case helpful, he gives an example of this. So, for instance, better parenting may reduce mental illness prevalence in the child over their life course but is it valid to then measure the short-term attachment level of parents and baby as a short-term um, believed indicator great question Adrian. thank you very much uh, james do you want to start and then and then jess i would i would say yes very much it is acceptable but depending on the stand the quality of the evidence base for that long-term change that's the key thing so in, in the case of parenting um we know for example that uh, the, the amount of time parents spend with their children um, is positively associated, causes um, positive outcomes, long-term outcomes in education. Okay, that's been proven um, by lots of different research. So if you're doing a parenting program focused on, on encouraging parents to work with their kids, um, then you, it, it lets you off the hook in a sense because you only really need to show that your program is encouraging parents to spend that amount of time with their children. So in that context, short-term outcomes are a good indicator of success. In other contexts where you don't really know what causes or helps the long-term change, uh, then it's harder because you then you do sort of need um, to, to, to collect that long-term data or, or at least encourage others to do so or encourage researchers, academics to do that sort of work. And we'll get asked just coming in one second, but James, just on that very point, is there a risk with theory of change that it gives you that false assurance that because you end up with a lovely diagram of some measures, which you can go, yeah, that that's right. But if you don't have the evidence base, it it might be it might be a, a, a clear plan which doesn't really work. Yeah, and that's one of the off, that's one of the frequent criticisms of it. Um, it. It can be a little bit of a smokescreen, or or it can. It can um, prevent people from engaging with really serious issues because they've got a nice model and it looks good. So, um, I mean, the proof of the pudding is in how uh, how well evidence the theory of change is through existing evidence, and that's quite easy to challenge. And if you remember back to when I was speaking, I did say that the fourth part of the process is that you scrutinise it and you challenge it and you look where the evidence is weak, and that is, that's sometimes forgotten, but it is important uh, to to do. And of course, the other side of it is that you still do have to collect the data. You still do have to test whether you, this model 
uh, actually works in the real world. Um, and again, that's it, it's really just the first part of that process of learning. Lovely. James, thanks very much. Still time for people to, to pop in questions, so please do that. Uh, Jess, using short-term markers as a way of thinking about long-term change, is that something which you've been doing in Kent? Yes, it is. I mean, I, I don't think you can do any work on health inequalities without using that principle, but I would absolutely agree with the previous speaker that, um, uh, you know, there are huge um, issues uh, at the, which he's um, said very eloquently about that. I think, um, yeah, where the evidence is really good uh, and you've got a very clear theory uh, of why that long term benefit, like childhood attachment, for example, um, I think you've got a very plausible case. Um, mental well-being is a very kind of amorphous concept. So anything that makes that concept uh, clearer in terms of evidence. So, for example, psychosocial stress, uh, you know, societal, um, you know, uh, that that leads to. Uh, you know, more GP uh, consultations, uh, missed appointments, you know, that kind of thing. If you can show that, then I think if you agree on uh, what an outcome measure is, it does help. But there are lots of, as the previous speaker says, there's lots of problems with it. Perfect. Uh, Jess, thank you very much. Uh, so again, we've got about seven minutes or so left. So please do, if you've got any sort of burning questions or comments, we'd love to hear them. Please do, please do put those in. Uh, Lily, just turning to you, a really important point, James, making about that, uh, the scrutiny of your theory of change. Um, what resources are available to help people put in, to, to, to grapple with the evidence, to look at data, to work out, is this, is this theory of change going to, going to give me false assurance or false assurance? Yeah, so it's been, you know, help having both um, Jess and James talking about things like the population level um, and, and also delivery level outcomes. And so that's some of the areas where we targeted our resources. So we started with, you know, the suite of 10 resources includes a plan that will help you put together the jigsaw locally as you know, in terms of leadership, you know, involving um, you know, sort of local communities um, and also you know, the evidence of what works um, in, in terms of what you might select as, as areas for action and also priorities um, to focus investment. We've got re uh, return on investment resources, which again, highlight the, uh, the sort of examples of work where you can actually draw cashable savings. And again, using that to reinvest and broker deals in terms of you know, investing in some of the other areas that you might want to around sort of psychosocial factors in particular. Um, and then also we have got a, you know, kind of a, quite a very good and very clear mapped out um, illustration of you know the role of psychosocial factors and again I'd encourage people to think about that again as to where they might want to direct their action um, and target target work so um, it's very broad in terms of the the range and it's designed so that you can select as you as you know as you wish as to what what you need so if that's data and intelligence then use our JSON a tool if again it's about the sort of financial and economic impact then actually use the return on investment but again if it's actually just checking back on whether or not you're putting your work together in the you know there's a component that you might be missing that is relevant for for designing your local work then actually again use the guidance That'd be great. And if people, I don't know why they wouldn't have done but if, if, if they haven't access yes, them What yet. I should say is that actually we're really fortunate that um, in this case, um, if you Google um, Prevention Concordia, at, right at the start comes all of the resources on, and they're posted on the publichealthengland.gov.uk website again so you can either go that way or through the google google route but also again if you hashtag prevention can call that then also again there's you know lots of the conversation there has also been signposting to the national resources but also things that people have been doing locally which again has been quite encouraging to see you know again that evidence of people and delivering designing and delivering change Lovely, great, Lily. Thank you very much. We are we are fast uh, running out of time, and so we will finish. We'll finish dead on too. Um, so I'm just going to give our, our speakers just advance warning. That would be lovely is if we could go around in one moment, uh, and just uh, if we could all give just one particular reflection from the discussion, uh, one particular thought, which um, uh, we might have scrawled in slightly larger font uh, than uh, any 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 of our other comments. Uh, so why don't we start here in the studio, and then we'll go to James, and then 
Jess, I'll start because I've, this is it's unfair not to. So I'll start and then go Lily and, and James, then Jess. Uh, so, so what really stood out for me, firstly,